I'm Michael Lawrence, I'm Chief Executive of Asia House. Today's session has been produced by Asia House and Business China. It's a pleasure to be working with the Business China team. My sincere thanks to them all. We have many hundreds of participants in today's events. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Today's discussion will be in English, but we are providing Mandarin translation. To access the translation, click on the interpretation button. It's an icon at the bottom of your screen and then click Chinese. That will give you the Mandarin translation. The global economy, as we know, is reeling from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. The dramatic drop in growth has been almost universal, with some predicting the world is now facing the worst economic period since the Great Depression. As countries start to emerge from their respective lockdown periods and try to kickstart their economies, the focus now is on recovery and all eyes are on China. But China has, for the first time since 1990, dropped its growth targets. It's done so in response to the impact of the pandemic and against the backdrop of the slump in economic activity globally, the disruption to supply chains and the drive to diversify them in the wake of the pandemic and escalating tensions between China and the US. Well, today we will explore the role China will play in ASEAN's economic recovery. And we do so just an hour or so after Singapore Prime Minister Li announced a general election to, as he said, clear the decks and give the new Singapore government a fresh five-year mandate, mandate. Well, we're fortunate today to be joined by four distinguished speakers. Dr. Kopo Kuhn, Senior Minister of State of Singapore's Ministry of Trade and Industry. Mukhtar Hussain, Group General Manager, Head of Belt and Road Initiative and Business Corridors at HSBC. Mukhtar is also Chairman of HSBC in Singapore. Cesar Parisima, former Philippine Secretary of Finance, founding partner at Eclas Capital, an Asia Fellow of the Milken Institute, and Tu Xingzhen, who is Executive Dean and Professor, China Institute of WTO Studies, University of International Business and Economics in Beijing. Thank you all very much for joining us. Shortly, I'll invite each of our panelists to speak for up to five minutes, and then we'll move to question and discussion. We welcome your participation in the debate today. If you wish to ask a question, please click on the raise hand icon and I'll do my best to bring you into the conversation a bit later in the session. But first, I'd like to invite Tin Pei Ling, Singapore Member of Parliament and CEO of Business China, the co-producers of today's session, to make some opening remarks. Ms. Tin. Thank you, Michael. And of course, a big welcome, as well as my sincere appreciation to all our distinguished speakers today. And a very good afternoon to all who are online to join us in this webinar. It has been a great pleasure to be able to partner Asia House, a highly valued partner of Business China. Today, this is the third installment of our, Future China, uh, our FC Future China Global Business Series. This series, we, this webinar series that we have brought to you, we hope to be able to bring to our members as well as audience the latest development on the trends and development uh, concerning China, ASEAN, as well as the world. And for us, Business China, our mission is to cultivate bilingual, bicultural talents and in short, in most recent times, to be Singapore-China savvy, so that uh, we are able to strengthen our position as the economic and cultural bridge connecting China and the world. Therefore, for this webinar series, we hope that with our esteemed speakers bringing to you the latest insights, we'll have a better understanding of what's the latest in China, as well as in ASEAN and the world. So partnering Asia House has been a great pleasure, as we hope that this becomes a platform that can bring you the East and West ideologies and looking at the issues of concern from different perspectives. So um, for today, we have our very distinguished speakers and I will let them uh, share with you more a little bit later. Uh, but prior to this, we are also very glad to have uh, very invaluable speakers from some of the Chinese firms such as uh, Tencent, McV, who had been sharing with us the latest uh, e-commerce as well as digital trends in China. And uh, after this, I'm sure we will have more in store for all of you. And I hope that you will stay tuned with us to uh, stay connected with us and we'll bring you the latest 
that we are able to offer in the region as well as in China. So with that, I shall not hold back, hold you all back for too long, and I will pass the time back to Michael as well as the panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, and it really has been great working with Business China. Thanks very much to you and, and your team. Well, let's get underway now, and I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Kopo Kuhn, Senior Minister of State of Singapore's Ministry of Trade and Industry, to make his opening remarks. Dr. Ko. Well, thank you, Michael. A very good evening to those participating in this uh, Future China Global Business Series from Singapore, and of course, a very good day to those joining from the UK and elsewhere. Thank you for having me on this uh, forum. Now, I think we all agree that these are unprecedented times for everyone. With the impact of COVID-19 extending well beyond uh, that of just economy, but into the realm of global health as well. And COVID-19 is an international health and economic crisis that requires a coordinated uh, global response. The economic toll includes widespread job losses, business closures, and slowing of growth. It is therefore timely for us to have this dialogue and share our perspectives and our thoughts on the impact of COVID-19 on the global economy and trade, as well as China's role in ASEAN's post-COVID-19 economic recovery. COVID-19 has caused disruptions in cross-border trade, global supply chains, and the movement of people. And the global economy has started to look very different as a result of all these disruptions. It is critical for all of us, governments, international and regional organizations, and businesses to work together to keep markets open and ensure that global supply chains remain connected and resilient. As part of the regional response to the pandemic, ASEAN countries and China are also enhancing cooperation to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on global and regional trade and investments. Amidst the challenges posed by COVID-19, it is important to remember that there are actually still pockets of opportunity, even as we press on with efforts to rebuild the global economy. Some companies may seek to diversify their production facilities beyond China in order to strengthen supply chain resilience. Many of these shifts are towards Southeast Asia as part of the larger trend of the shift of manufacturing activities to the region even before the pandemic struck. Chinese companies are also riding on the trend to expand their network of operations beyond China and transiting towards higher value industries. These opportunities could strengthen networks among businesses and people across the region and China and provide room for stronger economic cooperation between ASEAN and China especially amidst the impact of the global pandemic. In Singapore, we are progressively reopening our economy and our borders. We have worked with like-minded partners on initiatives to facilitate open and connected supply lines. And we are also gradually resuming travel in a calibrated manner with appropriate safeguards for public health in place. Fast lane arrangements have been launched to facilitate essential business and official travel with China. And we are also exploring similar arrangements with a few other countries and regions. Restoring these travel links is critical to help businesses continue their regional functions and to help economies move towards recovery, safeguarding livelihoods in the process. We will continue to maintain our status as an open, and connected business hub in the region and work closely with like-minded partners to pave the way for recovery. Now, close collaboration is key in overcoming common challenges and transforming ourselves to seek out new opportunities. To facilitate economic recovery during and beyond COVID-19, ASEAN and China can work closely in areas such as keeping trade routes and supply lines open, resuming cross-border travel in a safe and progressive manner, and supporting regional and global efforts to uphold a stable and peaceful international order. So I look forward to hearing from the panelists and the audience, and I wish all of you a fruitful session today. Thank you very much. Senior Minister, thank you very much indeed. I'd like to get the business view now. 
uh, especially about the Belt and Road project um, uh, and its role, the role that project that Vision may play in recovery. So over now to Mukta Hussain from HSBC. Mukta. Mukta, you're on mute, I'm afraid. We need to unmute you. Okay. That's great, thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Delighted to join you. Thank you, Michael, for the invitation. What I'd like to do in the time that I've got is really touch on three themes. Firstly, to perhaps suggest that uh, the relationship between China and ASEAN has been strong over a long period of time. Secondly, to touch on the theme of supply chains. And thirdly, to talk about the BRI in the context of what it can do to aid the recovery. So just, um, I suppose, a small tour of history. The ASEAN-China relationship actually goes back more than 50 years. Um, it's been assisted by a lot of bilateral cooperation, as the ministers just outlined. Uh, the first major trade agreement went, goes back to 2002. And actually, uh, China and ASEAN were signatories uh, to the RCEP. Um, last year, which again will uh, intensify trade and links uh, between the ASEAN countries and China. China already uh, is ASEAN's number one trading partner, um, according to the statistics for the first quarter of 2020, uh, uh, overtaking actually both the US and the EU. And I think that kind of points to the fact that we've got a tripolar world here at play. We've got Asia emerging as a strong block with increasing intensity of trade, investment, and people flows. Uh, we, of course, have Europe uh, and, and, and the US. I think the investment flows that are going on into the region are intensifying. The biggest investor in ASEAN is actually intra-Asian uh, countries from the ASEAN investing in ASEAN. And China absolutely has invested. Uh, today, it's the second largest investor in ASEAN behind Japan. And Japan, of course, has been a long-term investor over many years. I see these trends as intensifying, building on strong foundations of mutual cooperation that China and ASEAN have had over many years. And there's a real basis of confidence and goodwill both ways. I think also there's a sense of economic pragmatism. The ASEAN countries want a balanced relationship. They want to be able to trade in multiple directions, not only with China, but indeed with Europe and the US on an equal footing. So it's economic pragmatism at play. Secondly, um, around the theme of not just trade, but also trade investment also promotes the movement of people. And I think sometimes um, you know, we forget that students, uh, investors, um, tourists are also a very powerful source for connecting countries. Uh, and again, as the minister was saying, it's important that we make steps to bring that back in a post-COVID environment. On the issue of supply chains, let me just observe that there's been a lot of debate, Michael, around the disruption, dislocation, and that debate is entirely valid. But I think from where we see it, we see pragmatism amongst the participants. Uh, the issue of moving supply chains isn't just an issue around cost. It's also an issue around convenience. It's also an issue around the ecosystem of other specialist providers that make an ecosystem work. And I think in ASEAN, we have uh, good standards of education, increased investment in manufacturing. Um, a lot of people having successful experiences of having moved into ASEAN. And so in many ways, uh, that journey will intensify as more and more industries come out of China into ASEAN. And actually, this is not just restricted to the multinational companies. We're looking at Chinese OEMs who are equally faced with the same challenges around cost. But I think the other thing I would say around supply chains is people are very concerned to make sure that they retain access to the China market. So in many ways, the supply chain debate is China plus one. It's more around making sure that production is aligned to where the consumer markets for those goods are. And we see plenty of examples of that taking place. Last but not least on the Belt and Road, the Belt and Road is a significant investor in ASEAN. There's about $80 billion of projects that have been announced. Those have been turned back into about $70 billion of recognizable investment. That infrastructure investment is essential because the estimates around in infrastructure investment in ASEAN amount to about $1.5 to $2 trillion over the next 10 years. 
And that gap uh, is a very significant gap. COVID in many ways imposes even more discipline around, in, uh, around the need to get the private sector engaged and the need to promote a third party cooperation to make this multilateral and to make this a joint initiative amongst many countries rather than a solo endeavor. And I think China has taken on board many of the lessons um, around structuring, around financial feasibility, around engagement, uh, to make this open, green and clean. We believe that the Belt and Road is an enabler of cooperation and an enabler of economic growth uh, in a post-COVID environment. I'll leave my comments at that, Michael. Mukhtar, thank you very much. Let's go to Manila now and Cesar Parisima. Cesar. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Michael. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone, Your Excellency. Uh, China will definitely uh, play a very important role uh, uh, post-COVID. As Mokhtar mentioned, it's already the largest uh, trading partner of uh, uh, ASEAN. It's uh, a major uh, uh, investor. Uh, the other important thing about China is uh, it has an Asia strategy. It has RCEP, it has BRI, uh, and it really wants to engage with us simply because uh, we are its uh, uh, neighborhood. But I'd like to point out that we cannot ignore uh, the US, the EU, and our other trading uh, partners. After all, the vision of ASEAN is really to be the hub of Asia uh, trade. And we need to uh, make sure that our, that engagement uh, be uh, continued. I think what ASEAN ought to realize is that COVID-19 has uh, amplified a lot of uh, uh, issues. It's, for example, fast track uh, digitalization. It's uh, uh, amplified uh, the, the trade war. It's uh, amplified the, the, the very passionate debate about the globalization. It's, uh, you know, uh, increasing, it's increased the polarization of uh, domestic politics in many of our trading uh, uh, partners. So what will this mean to uh, ASEAN? Outside of a health crisis, uh, COVID uh, will actually uh, reshape, uh, or at least there will be a pressure to reshape uh, uh, supply chains. Um, right now, I think uh, uh, a lot of global supply chains want more reliability. In that case, they want to shorten, so, uh, shorter supply chains, uh, which means uh, maybe uh, reshoring, uh, bringing back uh, uh, production facilities back to home uh, uh, countries. This will also address probably some political pressure and will probably be facilitated by the fact that uh, digitalization will allow them to save on, uh, on uh, labor and uh, uh, tap the higher skills uh, back home. Uh, consolidation will probably also happen, bringing uh, uh, production facilities closer uh, to where the market uh, uh, is. Here, I think um, the large markets and the higher growth markets uh, will uh, uh, benefit. Um, I think uh, this is where ASEAN has to focus. Uh, rather than focus on what's going on outside, focus on what's going within. Because uh, individually, the ASEAN countries are nothing other than probably Indonesia. Uh, and clearly, we need to uh, make sure that ASEAN centrality is uh, uh, maintained. And uh, this is the silver lining of COVID-19 for uh, ASEAN. Uh, we really have to prove to outside investors because uh, the competition for investments moving forward will be quite uh, uh, more intense given the economic problems around the uh, world. So we have to prove to everyone that we are one market. And uh, making us one market means harmonization of uh, standards, uh, lifting a lot of the non-tariff uh, uh, barriers, using digital uh, technology to make it easier uh, to trade across uh, borders in uh, ASEAN. Consider uh, maybe uh, aligning our customs border maybe into two, uh, the ASEAN six and then the CLMT uh, countries as uh, uh, one. Because without you know, dealing with those issues, our ability to attract uh, investors uh, and take advantage of this, uh, uh, the opportunities that will arise out of uh, COVID-19 will be uh, limited. For example, uh, uh, Singapore had, uh, has had this initiative of the ASEAN single window. I think uh, that should really be a uh, fast track uh, so that uh, one should bring goods to ASEAN and it's just entered once into a database and then uh, uh, it, it, it is now good for all the ASEAN member countries. 
Uh, the minister uh, and Mokhtar mentioned the importance of uh, travel and tourism, uh, the ability to travel within ASEAN and uh, outside ASEAN. Here, I think uh, ASEAN has shown some uh, uh, weakness during the crisis where uh, there's really been uh, very little coordination in terms of policy, in terms of information sharing, in terms of uh, uh, procurement uh, uh, when we were dealing with uh, uh, and are dealing in the COVID-19. Um, my suggestion is that uh, ASEAN step up by coming up with an ASEAN health card that is common to all ASEAN uh, uh, countries that should uh, facilitate uh, uh, trust and uh, allow uh, freer mobility and, uh, you know, uh, reestablish tourism. Uh, Intra-ASEAN tourism, as you know, uh, is at about 36% of all our tourists and it's a major uh, industry in uh, uh, ASEAN. I think uh, uh, these are some of the opportunities that uh, uh, ASEAN uh, can uh, do. So basically my message is this. Yes, China will definitely play an important role, but we have to continue our engagement not only with China, with the US, with the EU, Japan, and the rest of the world, because ASEAN's vision is really to be at the hub of uh, uh, trade. And two, we need to look inwards to really try and remove the barriers to integration so that we can really present ourselves as a, a, a legitimate uh, one uh, market. Inter-ASEAN trade right now is only around 24% and mostly intermediate goods. We need to increase that, uh, you know, with, with a lot of pressure globally on uh, uh, the, global, the globalization. One of the ways to address it is make sure that we're able to tap our own uh, uh, markets. So, uh, Michael, I think that's uh, my main uh, uh, message. Um, ASEAN centrality is key uh, moving uh, uh, forward. Suzam, so, thank you very much. Much to follow up there. COVID-19, perhaps uh, an accelerator, a driver of further integration of ASEAN. Uh, let's go to Beijing now. Uh, very warm welcome to Professor Tu. Professor. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Uh, good afternoon. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic did show that uh, the global supply chains have some uh, inherent vulnerabilities. It is economically and commercially reasonable to shorten or diversify the supply resources with a view to enhance the security and the resilience. Uh, therefore, to strengthen a regional supply chain, which is more accessible and controllable, will be a natural choice. Uh, actually, it has already happened. The share of ASEAN in China's foreign trade in the first quarter of this year has reached 15.1%. Uh, ASEAN has uh, taken the place of EU as China's largest trading partner. Uh, however, a more critical and disruptive factor is behind this transition. Uh, the United States seems uh, determined to decouple with China on a variety of fronts. Uh, while China is definitely unhappy about that, we have to live with the reality. The US surely has the right to choose its uh, partner. Uh, Confucius also said, Men of totally different principles can never act together. Uh, but I don't believe that China is so different from the others that we cannot coexist with each other. Uh, and I'm a I'm little confused that uh, why there are so many criticisms of China damaging the uh, existing liberal world order. It is actually the United States withdrawing from its commitments to a long list of international organizations including Paris Convention on Climate Change, TBP, UNESCO, now WHO. China has done nothing extraordinary. In the case of trade policy, while you could argue that China's policies and systems are not fully consistent with WTO rules, China has never imposed the unilateral tariffs on any trading partners, which the United States has been repeatedly doing in the last few years. So I think China is still working hard to integrate itself into the international society. Uh, so I believe that China wants to decouple with the rest of the world, even though the US is trying to isolate China. In terms of further regional cooperation, the top priority is of course to finish the RCEP and ratify it uh, as soon as possible. Uh, RCEP is led by ASEAN and China has made its uh, own uh, contributions to it. 
according to a recent Peterson Institute research, the income increase effect of RCEP 15 is already larger than CPTPP. It would be even better uh, if India could get on board. Uh, in light of uh, the pandemic, I do believe that we should accelerate the process to dismantle these unreasonable ob obstacles and to create more opportunities for re uh, economic recovery in the region. Uh, moreover, uh, you may notice that uh, Premier Li Keqiang stated that uh, China is open and positive uh, to the CPTPP. Actually, many uh, believe that uh, joining CPTPP would, even, uh, would be even more beneficial for China uh, than joining RCEP. Uh, I am aware that uh, there are some concerns about China's policy changes in recent years, especially the state-owned enterprises have been given more resources and powers. Some observers even claim that uh, the state strikes back and the China's market-oriented reforms have finished. I'm afraid that uh, such kind of uh, concerns are too pessimistic. Uh, reform and opening up is not an easy task for China. Uh, China's learning curve is not linear. There will, there will be uh, always some ups and downs. Uh, but as long as you believe that market economy is the truth, then you should believe that China will finally come back to the universal norm. Uh, actually, you may notice that uh, the Chinese government just released a document uh, in April, uh, in the middle of the pandemic, or in the height of the pandemic, to accelerate the reform of the factor markets. China just also announced the establishment of a Hainan free trade port filled with uh, uh, ambitious uh, policy uh, changes. Uh, and yesterday, uh, President Xi Jinping uh, uh, reconfirmed, along with his European counterparts, uh, to conclude uh, EU-China investment treaty negotiations by the end of this year. Um, then uh, joining CPTPP will be a natural next step after the signing of RCEP. So I'm uh, optimistic about China's future reform and opening up. Uh, and uh, this will create more opportunities for our ASEAN neighbors uh, to take advantage of China's economic growth uh, and opening up. Uh, so I, I still believe that China will reach a larger convergence with the rest of the world. Thank you. Professor, thank you very much. Thank you all for your opening remarks. Much to digest there. So we'll open it up for questions. Now we're already getting some questions in from the audience and I will go to those uh, in, in just a few moments, but I want to start first question to um, uh, Dr. Ko, and it has to be about the election announcement, not entirely unexpected, but are you surprised that it's been announced now in the midst of the pandemic? Well, I think as the uh, Prime Minister explained in his uh, address to the nation a uh, short while ago, um, you know, we're all in the midst of trying to control the uh, COVID pandemic. And I think, uh, you know, having control, you know, suppress the numbers down and keep things at a very manageable level, we see a window of opportunity to clear the decks, as he said, so that we can focus the attention of the uh, new term of government in tackling the challenges that will come. And you know, the, the challenges will be quite significant and you will be for quite a, a period of time. So I think this is really just seizing the window of opportunity to clear the decks. Okay, well, back to the, the topic at hand, as it were. Um, a lot of reference there to the role China plays in ASEAN, historically, as Mukhtar pointed out, and, and, and others, and the, the trading relationships that already exist. But do you expect China to play an even bigger role in ASEAN going forward against the backdrop of the US retreating, uh, nationalistic policies elsewhere, slow down, you know, sharp slowdown in the economies in, in, the, in the West, and China perhaps becoming the growth engine for the region. So are you looking at China to play an even bigger role in ASEAN over the next few years? Dr. Ko. Oh, I think China will continue to always be uh, an important market for countries in ASEAN. I think the trade numbers have shown that we are uh, key trading partners with each other, China with ASEAN and ASEAN with China. And 
uh, China will continue to, to be an outsized uh, economic powerhouse in this part of the world with their big domestic market that would be of interest to businesses based in, in ASEAN. ASEAN on its own will also be uh, growing, uh, hopefully, you know, as projected despite the uh, COVID disruption, uh, to be the fourth largest economic bloc in the world within the next decade or so. Um, we have a young population in ASEAN, a sizable population of 600 million or so, and the infrastructure needs continue to grow because of the uh, rising middle class here in ASEAN. So I think that kind of trajectory uh, of ASEAN and the size of China's market will continue to intertwine uh, the mutual needs of ASEAN and China in the, in the immediate decade or so. And I do see China and ASEAN continuing to be better intertwined, especially with the challenges brought up by COVID that the other panelists have uh, articulated earlier. The nearshoring or reshoring of supply chains and the China plus one strategy of uh, resupply lines being uh, you know, reshaped post-COVID. I think this will put ASEAN in a very uh, favorable position in the immediate vicinity of China to be that plus one uh, from China. And I think this continues to be opportunities that businesses in ASEAN continue to look at seriously. Okay, thank you. Cesar, I want to turn to you now. You talked about ASEAN integration and COVID, the impact of COVID possibly accelerating it, but you also pointed out that the initial response from ASEAN countries were very nationalistic. There was very little, if any, cooperation in dealing with the health crisis itself. You know, with what, in what confidence do you have that ASEAN will take COVID-19, the pandemic, as a, as a trigger to drive much more rapid integration? Well, I think if we want to uh, uh, make sure that uh, we are a successful post-COVID as we were before, uh, there is no other uh, direction but to stick uh, closer uh, uh, together. Because as I mentioned, individually, uh, the ASEAN countries are very uh, uh, small. Uh, going back first to the main topic of the uh, discussion, I uh, con uh, concur with uh, Dr. Ko that uh, Yes, uh, the engagement with uh, China will uh, increase uh, for several reasons. Uh, it's advances in the application of uh, digital uh, technology in uh, facilitating uh, commerce uh, is uh, uh, well known to all of us. And that is very, going to be very useful uh, for ASEAN, uh, at least in most of ASEAN, infrastructure is uh, a bit backwards and a way to uh, uh, make a great leap is really to uh, go into uh, uh, digital technology in areas like uh, fintech, e-commerce. So that's uh, one. Uh, two, uh, with the launch of RCEP, and I hope RCEP is uh, uh, launched, it's going to be very comprehensive. It will uh, help ASEAN uh, uh, deal with some of its own challenges, for example, uh, uh, in terms of non-tariff uh, uh, measures and uh, making sure that we have better quality uh, uh, free trade uh, uh, agreements and China is at the heart uh, uh, of that uh, agreement. Uh, third, with the uh, U.S. and uh, China trade dispute, I think the role of ASEAN will be uh, uh, made uh, more important as the hub uh, through which uh, I think uh, uh, trade uh, will go through. Uh, and I think that was the original idea, uh, ASEAN being the weakest and the one with the least uh, 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 historical issues with other regions no, is a more logical place where uh, global trade uh, can uh, uh, diverge and uh, you know so that we can continue to facilitate uh, uh, that but for us to uh, make that vision uh, uh, a reality uh, we really have to uh, uh, invest in connectivity harmonization uh, putting together our capital uh, uh, markets and this we will have to do with a weak center uh, because we don't have a Germany to fund uh, mm -hmm. our uh, our uh, ASEAN in the, uh, Jakarta, but clearly we have to do uh, with it. Mukta, I want to turn to you now. Um, talk about uh, RCEP um, uh, and other trade deals. Trade corridor is one of your strategic responsibilities with HSBC. Are you looking at a reshaping of trade? Um, of trading blocks, trading routes, trading deals uh, more regionally within ASEAN and within Asia as a result of the pandemic? I would observe, Michael, that regionalization has been underway over a, period, a long period of time. And I think what COVID does, as we were saying earlier, is to just reinforce the intensity and the speed of travel in terms of 
looking at Asia as both a, a consumption market as well as a production market. And in the corridors that we see, we see uh, increasing flows of capital, um, both in terms of trade and in terms of foreign direct investment uh, happening uh, in Asia. And this is a trend that we observe um, across um, our network and we see that continuing. I think the other thing just to uh, allude to this is, you know, the people connectivity remains strong and it, it, it's, uh, you know, connections are made through travel, connections are made through investment, connections are made through people uh, and the people to people connectivity, as we've all said, remains a core component of that. But the data would suggest that the major capital that's flowing into Asia will come from Asia. And secondly, Asia effectively is now going to become a consumption market, having been a production market in the past. And that trajectory tends to lend uh, further credence to the fact that it's becoming increasingly intra-regional market. I think 60%, Michael, of trade today uh, is intra-regional in Asia. That compares with something like 70% plus in the EU. And I see that trajectory uh, being aligned in due course. Okay, thanks. I want to go to some of the questions that have popped up on the, the Q&A uh, chat uh, because the, the audience is clearly very keen uh, to, to, to get in. And uh, uh, Professor Tu, there's an interesting question here from Ernesto Brahm. Uh, we see, see increased polarization between China on the one hand and the US, Australia, etc. on the other. What unilateral steps, both economic and political, could China take to de-escalate this conflict? Okay, uh, uh, thanks for the question. It's a hard one. <laughs> um, I think, uh, you know, in the, in the last uh, few years, uh, the so-called US-China trade war has uh, uh, lasted uh, and, uh, and impacted the world and also the Chinese economy. Uh, and inside China, actually, the main, uh, the main policy suggestion is to uh, to do ourselves work better. Uh, so actually, it's, it's unilateral, which means that uh, we should, as I said, we should speed up our uh, domestic reform uh, and opening up, uh, no matter what the US has been doing to us. So uh, I think, yes, especially economically, I, I think uh, uh, the, the, the steps, uh, actually, we have taken uh, some steps including uh, like our unilateral actions to uh, push forward IPR protection and uh, to uh, reduce the negative lists of uh, uh, foreign investments. And also, as I said, uh, we create uh, some free trade zones and ports. Um, so uh, this is, I think, uh, I think, as I said, the major concern of the West uh, is the Slow down of China's uh, market uh, marketization in recent years. Uh, then I, I think we should uh, uh, do the opposite. We should accelerate the process. Uh, but politically, I, I think it's more difficult uh, because uh, it's not uh, up to us. Uh, uh, it's mainly up to the United States, uh, especially as I said. If the United States is so determined to take China as an rivalry or even enemy, um, then uh, as I said, it's, uh, it's, it would be difficult for us to, to uh, take some uh, reactions. Uh, if uh, the government is too soft, uh, then it will create some domestic difficulties. Yes. But uh, if uh, it's uh, too hard, then it will create some even more uh, rivalries. But just so, to be clear, Professor, yeah. you, you feel that China should and most likely will accelerate its market reforms yes. based on COVID-19, but the, the pressure from the US is actually an impediment to that. Um, I, I don't think it's, a, it's an impediment to that. Uh, actually, uh, uh, I mean, domestic reforms uh, sometimes need some outside pressures. Hmm. Uh, so to some extent, uh, US pressures are good uh, to speed up China's domestic reform. Uh, but as I said, so, so anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's easier uh, to pr pr push forward economic reforms, but it's more difficult to, um, 
make some political uh, uh, come down uh, between uh, uh, the US and China. Okay, thank you. Um, on that same theme, and, and this to you, uh, Dr. Ko from Raphael Key, um, the US is pushing regional countries like the EU, Japan, Australia, to, to take their side basically and to be anti-China. Uh, this, this is happening, there's, there's clear pressure, we've heard it. Uh, but what happens if ASEAN is forced to take sides? Do you fear that there is that sort of pressure from the US to choose one or the other? Well, I think um, many countries around the world would like to uh, see that there is a geopolitical cooperation between the big powers and the big economies, because I think this world is where you see more and more connectivity, right? The technology front is pushing for more connectivity, e-commerce, uh, digital connectivity. So the trend towards connectivity is there. It is the way consumers want to see trade being done, how they consume products and all. So I think the larger trend of connectivity would therefore mean that uh, many people, many economies would like to see greater cooperation and connectivity. I think what this COVID-19 pandemic has shown us is that no country can be self-sufficient on everything. And I think we do realize that there is some degree of interdependency, no matter how we want to decouple ourselves and uh, you know, be isolated from everyone else, the truth is that we all need something from one another. And I think this is where hopefully there's a realization that uh, cooperation is better than isolation. And I think countries generally want to, to you know, work with both parties, China and the US as well. And we hope that uh, you know, cool heads will prevail, that there will be greater realization that it's better to work together for general global uh, uh, prosperity. Okay, thank you. Another question now from Kim Huat Chia. And this to Cesar, if you don't mind. Would the US, Europe and China accept ASEAN as a neutral hub in a, an increasingly bifurcated world? Uh, I, I think so. Uh, I think uh, that the uh, ASEAN, uh, if you look at um, Asia, is the most uh, non-threatening region <laughs> to uh, the US, uh, uh, EU and other uh, uh, areas, simply because uh, uh, for example, when you take about um, his, when you look at history, uh, the U.S. Uh, had the Philippines as a colony, and when you look at the other ASEAN countries, uh, many of them were European uh, uh, colonies. So you have this strong uh, historical uh, uh, linkages. No? But um, I think uh, ASEAN will have to play whatever card it's dealt with. But the card that it must play is the ASEAN centrality. Uh, card. For example, uh, uh, the U.S. is increasingly uh, looking inward. Uh, if you really look at the history of the U.S., for most of its history, it's been an inward-looking country. It was only after World War II when it started to uh, uh, look uh, uh, globally. And, uh, you know, I won't be surprised that uh, uh, they will continue to look inward because among the countries of the world, they're probably the most self-sufficient. But uh, we're not. And clearly, as a, as a region, we have to play it uh, smart. Obviously, the most ideal situation is we become the hub and we are connected through, uh, uh, to all the countries. And uh, uh, despite uh, whatever um, tension ge geopolitically go is going on with our partners, we are looked at as a neutral uh, 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 entity. But uh, the most important thing in all of this is that uh, we continue to strengthen the integration of uh, uh, ASEAN so that uh, we can really truly look at ourselves as uh, a seamless uh, uh, market where uh, goods and services can move uh, seamlessly so that we become attractive in and of ourselves. Okay, I now want to bring in a question from uh, Li Yi Xian, who's the chairman of Business China is actually on the line and asked him to ask this question rather than by me. Uh, hello, yes, uh, I'm not sure if you can start my video. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, gentlemen, and uh, I appreciate all your viewpoints. I think my, uh, interestingly, my, my question is uh, um, more on the European reaction to uh, what's going on in this part of the world. I know we are focusing on uh, ASEAN, 
uh, as a as you know neutral and uh, you know uh, a body linking the east and the west. Uh, we are interested in China. How uh, China recent policies uh, continue their market reform and their engagement with uh, the neighboring countries for further economic integration. Um, and then we talk about the bi bifurcated world. You know the trade wars between uh, U.S. and China. But what about the European reaction? Do you think that is uh, there is a greater possibility now, given the situation that uh, Europe and ASEAN will come uh, even closer together? Why don't we start with you, Cesar, on that one? Well, um, I think so. Uh, given that the US EU is under uh, strain, um, uh, I think uh, EU will continue to try to uh, uh, become more independent rather than dependent on US uh, global uh, uh, view. Um, I think uh, it's an opportune time for both the EU and uh, uh, ASEAN to uh, strengthen its uh, uh, ties. Uh, we are in the process of negotiating the EU uh, ASEAN, the Philippines as well. Uh, uh, I think uh, it's an opportunity to uh, uh, try and uh, cover up, uh, cover uh, whatever we will lose uh, from uh, if the U.S. continues to proceed on this uh, uh, path. But obviously, I think uh, it will be a better world if all of us are in uh, together in uh, you know a more integrated world. Uh, Dr. Ko, the same question to you, please. Well, I think that there is definitely interest from the EU to engage deeper with ASEAN. As I said earlier, ASEAN is projected to become the fourth largest economic bloc within the next decade. And you see that the EU has already uh, embarked on free trade agreements with Vietnam and, and Singapore. We have the EU-Singapore free trade agreement being ratified towards the end of last year as well. I think that points to a larger trend for the EU wanting to engage more with individual countries in ASEAN and perhaps at some point as a stepping stone to an EU-ASEAN type of FTA. Okay, thanks. I want to move to BRI now because there's lots of questions coming in on BRI and I've coupled myself. But uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, Mukta, first one to you from Greg uh, Hodkinson. Given sharply increased government debt to deal with COVID-19 impact, both in ASEAN and in China, will there be an impact on funding available for BRI, for BRI program? Mukta. I think it's fair to say, Michael, that um, funding BRI it came largely from the Chinese policy institutions, the development banks, um, Exim Bank and Sinoshore. I think that going ahead, the reality is China has a limitation in how much it needs to fund BRI and how attractive it would be to get investment in um, from other agencies, whether they be multilaterals or commercial banks. Now, in order for that to happen, I think clearly BRI did need to uh, develop a framework that was far more sustainable for private sector capital. And I think that's the commitment that President Xi gave last year on open, green, clean, transparent, market-based structures. I think it remains to be seen how this plays out, but I think to answer Greg's question, I do believe that private sector has a bigger role to play. I do believe that multilateral institutions, third-party market cooperation, will drive that capital in. The last point I'd make on BRI is that you know, governments were constrained before COVID, they're even more constrained now, and therefore private capital, and particularly the mobilization of the private sector, becomes very important in the next phase of BRI. And we've begun to see that play out in one or two markets in particular. So take Indonesia, a lot of the investment that's come there in the nickel uh, sector, where uh, you've got to refine it onshore in Indonesia, has come from private sector companies on a purely commercial basis. So I think uh, you know, there is hope for the future that funding will become more diversified. Okay, I'd like the, the Professor to the same question to you. The um, unlocking private capital into infrastructure generally is one of the vexing questions on the planet, and with BRI in particular at a time when governments have such high levels of debt. Can China adapt, will it attract private capital to, 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 to continue or add momentum to BRI? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, uh, actually uh, in recent years, the Chinese government has already been facing some difficulties 
in terms of revenues. Uh, uh, now, uh, with this uh, pandemic, uh, the difficulties are even larger. Uh, as I know, some uh, government agencies, uh, uh, both at the central level and the local levels, are cutting their uh, budgets. So uh, definitely, there will be a limit limit on uh, the available uh, public fund for BRI. So it's uh, it's uh, of course necessary to attract more. Uh, private uh, uh, capital into uh, BRI. I think uh, the the initial attention of the Chinese government uh, is to um, uh, use uh, government funds as a kind of a catalyst uh, to create some uh, basis for uh, the involvement of private uh, funds uh, into BRI projects. Uh, because uh, at, at uh, the early stage, BRI was very um, very new and, uh, and uh, unknown, I think, to private companies. So uh, then the government will uh, encourage uh, SOEs and, uh, and uh, public institutions to invest in BRI. But after a couple of years, uh, uh, now BRI, I think, has been considered uh, very uh, mature, at least more mature than before. Uh, so, and also private companies are more interested in uh, investing in BRI. Uh, I think both uh, for Chinese companies, but also for uh, foreign companies. So we create some so-called uh, third-party cooperation uh, programs uh, to uh, introduce the foreign investors uh, into uh, BRI projects. I, I think uh, China is uh, really uh, open uh, in this respect uh, to, as I said, to introduce uh, both Chinese private capitals and also foreign private capitals into BRI projects. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, question now, and I'll start with you, Dr. Ko, from TC2. Uh, can the panel comment on what China and ASEAN can do due to COVID-19 to accelerate sustainable development towards meeting the net zero target? So sustainability in this post-COVID world. Well, I, I think um, the uh, the the whole issue of uh, COVID-19 is that it has brought some disruptions. But many of the longer term goals and the needs, whether it's the world or the region, still remains. And therefore, some of these um, areas of investments, of uh, bringing critical infrastructure, of uh, seeding technology, that can bring about some of these longer term goals, including net zero targets, for example, will probably require uh, things multilateral organizations to continue to work together. And I think in that sense, uh, what Singapore has put in place uh, in organization we call Infrastructure Asia, that brings together multilateral funding organizations, uh, private sector with expertise to seek those areas we need and make sure that these projects are structured in a, in a sustainable way that has got uh, a bankable kind of uh, outcome so that it, it has got some tangible returns that funds itself over a longer period of time while meeting the needs of the public. And when it comes to issues of energy uh, and also uh, greenhouse emissions, I think these also require degrees of funding and technology as well. So I think whether it is China, whether it is ASEAN, I think we all require some multilateral platform to work together and to allow some of these to become a reality. Uh, Cesar, I want to come to you on this. The you know uh, uh, sustainability very high on the agenda in policy terms in boardrooms uh, in, in 2019. But you now have the world in economic crisis. You now have fossil fuel prices having fallen dramatically. So particularly for developing economies or economies in in, in, in ASEAN, is the green agenda sustainability going to fall way down the agenda? Uh, I think. Uh... Um, on the other, uh, you know, uh, it will uh, be the uh, potential to uh, help us uh, get out of uh, the COVID uh, uh, situation. In fact, uh, uh, that is the opportunity for BRI uh, to uh, redesign BRI uh, so that uh, we can have a green uh, Silk Road initiative and a digital Silk Road uh, uh, initiative. Uh, the BRI is the largest uh, infrastructure program there is. But uh, I think uh, given what they've learned so far in the implementation, I hope that the Chinese will uh, uh, redesign it 
so that it can uh, truly be a win-win sustainable uh, effort that will improve uh, uh, the connectivity amongst uh, us both physically and digitally, but as well as uh, help us go down the green, uh, uh, the path towards a greener future. Mukhtar, to you, what are you hearing from clients and what are you seeing, especially in Belt and Road projects, on the sustainability front, but also something that Cesar's talked about quite a lot, the digitalization program, will that be accelerated because of COVID-19? Um, it's very clear, Michael, in all the conversations we have with um, our clients, whether they be governments or corporates or entrepreneurs, that the green agenda really now lies at the heart of the debate. There's an absolute willingness and a desire to kind of institutionalize this into best practice. We've seen some of that begin to take place over the last uh, few years with more and more, for example, in the, in the energy space, solar projects now uh, are being executed um, on a very efficient scale basis. And there's a reason to believe that we can spread that across the world. The second thing, really echoing what um, has been said by earlier speakers, is that we kind of need to institutionalize this wish or this desire or this plan. And that's going to find a way of uh, lying at the core of approval processes, whether they be from multilaterals or from financial institutions, so that green is not just desirable, it becomes an essential component of the way uh, institutions like HSBC that has a big commitment to sustainability fund future projects. And I think we're, we're seeing that. On the digital aspects, I agree entirely with Cesar's comments. I think that you know, we're seeing a lot more interest in adopting digital solutions, uh, whether it be from our customers or whether it be from governments. The interaction, the touch points that digital provides for are essential. I think the other thing I would say is that the investor community is also one that is increasingly demanding uh, that what they invest in is, 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 is green and it uh, satisfies a sustainability objective. So I think we've got convergence and the objective, we just need to institutionalize the path. Thank you. Uh, Professor Tu, uh, view from Beijing, uh, is the green agenda now institutionalized or needs to be institutionalized? Is it at the very heart of investing? Uh, pardon, sorry. Is the, is, is the green agenda um, or is, it, is the, the demand for sustainability from the perspective of Beijing at the very top of the agenda? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, uh, Beijing in the, la in the last uh, few years, uh, Beijing was uh, uh, suffering uh, from the, 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 uh, the frog, uh, the smog <laughs> very much. Uh, but uh, uh, after a few years uh, efforts, uh, the situation is much better. But I, I think uh, the green uh, uh, development has become a very strong consensus uh, in China, uh, everywhere, not only in Beijing, I think in everywhere. So uh, I think uh, sustainability uh, now is, uh, is very uh, uh, popular in China. Uh, and with regard to the COVID-19, as uh, panelists, uh, previous panelists said, I think uh, uh, the development of digital economy is really a, a very opportunity, I think, a good opportunity uh, for uh, sustainable development because uh, digitalization could replace uh, some old fashioned uh, uh, economic be uh, behaviors uh, like, like uh, we are do what we are doing at the digital conference. Um, uh, so, so this is really uh, create a new opportunity for uh, green economy de development, but of course it also creates maybe cre will create some uh, challenges uh, because, as I said, the uh, uh, digital economy will replace the old economy. Uh, like uh, now we can have uh, uh, have a conference uh, digitally, then we don't need to travel. Mm. Uh, then we don't need to buy uh, fly tickets, <laughs> although we don't need to uh, live in uh, hotels. So what are these uh, industries will, uh, going to do? So anyway, I think it's, uh, 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 there'll be uh, both uh, opportunities and the challenges. Okay, thank you very much. Look, we, we are just about out of time, but I'd like, if you don't mind, to ask each of, uh, of my guests one, one final question. And, and Dr. Ko, I'll start with you. You talked in your opening remarks about opportunities that, that, that may emerge uh, of, uh, and potentially of, of countries companies 
working more closely together. But we're still in the midst of the pandemic. Um, there are some economic forecasts which are very bleak, some which are slightly less so. Where do you sit on that scale? Are you slightly more optimistic that in 2021 there'll be a turnaround, there'll be um, uh, uh, fewer tensions geopolitically and business opportunities will start to emerge? Or are you at the, 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 the more hawkish end of the spectrum where this is going to be a prolonged, deep and very painful economic period? Well, I think the, the first thing is, as a doctor, I can tell you that nobody can tell when this pandemic is going to be over, right? We're all hoping for a vaccine to come, but uh, getting a working vaccine and getting it in double quick time is not a certainty at all. Mm. So for businesses, if you were to work on the, uh, uh, the idea that the vaccine will be materializing soon, then I think you're not really well prepared for the worst case scenario. But if we're prepared for the eventuality that COVID is going to last for some time, and that a vaccine may not be near in, available in the near term, then I think you have a more realistic appreciation of the challenges that will come and the challenges that you have to face, but also then start to look at opportunities can, that can arise from that. I would say that, uh, that the COVID-19 has not changed the broad direction of where the economy is transforming into one that's more digitized, into one that perhaps will require more automation. These trends are still there. 5G is still going to come whether COVID is here or not. And what COVID-19 has done is to accelerate some of these trends that we already see before COVID-19. The trend of automation, the trend of robotization, the trend of uh, geopolitical contests and geostrategic competition, the, the trend of supply chain disruption from potential decoupling of economies. All these things are accentuated by COVID-19. And some reports in McKenzie said that in the last eight weeks, we see five years worth of digitalization a big leap forward for many businesses and out of sheer necessity. But I think this trend will continue to stay. And when people talk about the new normal, actually, this is not new. It is actually a fast forward of what will happen in a few years' time, and the future is today. And therefore, the need to transform will continue to be there. And in the midst of transformation, I think we will see new opportunities that comes from other areas of technology that unleashes the potential of our small and business, uh, small business, medium business, and also multinationals as well. Cesar, final question to you uh, on ASEAN in particular. You talked about the health card, you talked about more rapid integration, you talked about harmonizing uh, uh, and the like. But as I said earlier, first instance of COVID-19 suggested quite the contrary. Uh, will there be an acceleration? Will there be a political push to rapidly integrate ASEAN because of the impact of COVID-19? Well, um, I think uh, uh, what has happened uh, is a result of the fact that um, we really have a weak uh, uh, center, for example, unlike uh, the EU, although they do have their own uh, uh, problems. My hope is that uh, in ASEAN, we create a model uh, that is a PPP model, uh, where the change uh, will be driven by private sector working closely with uh, uh, governments. Uh, we may not have uh, uh, Germany, but we do have a Singapore that's quite advanced. And uh, for example, sharing technology amongst each other, sharing best practices amongst each other, I, I think uh, will um, allow us uh, to ultimately get to where uh, uh, we want. Small things, I think. Uh, the Asian single window, the Asian health uh, uh, card, harmonization of uh, standards, this uh, require not much money, but political will to actually agree uh, to standardize uh, uh, things. Harmonization of processes, uh, you know, um, we can start with, uh, with a low hanging uh, uh, opportunity. COVID-19 is a wake up call. It's a wake up call for uh, the whole world that uh, we need more sustainable uh, uh, economic uh, models. If it's not the virus, it might be climate uh, related or uh, uh, something else. And therefore, we need to make adjustments in the model and take advantage of the technology that's available now. COVID-19 is a wake-up call to ASEAN that we cannot forever rely on global free trade and that we have to look within so that we can be more sustainable. Thank you. Mukhtar, your final question. Again, it's about financing a Belt and Road. You've touched on it earlier. The, the, the competition for investment is going to be intense. 
in the post-COVID world. And yet there is a desperate need for infrastructure and a need to, for private capital to finance this. Is this pandemic a way of accelerating that push? I believe it is. I mean, I would uh, suggest, Michael, that never, lie, uh, never let a crisis go to waste. And what this crisis does is provide the opportunity for structural reform. Uh, I think if you look back on former crises, I think Asia did very well with its financial crisis back in 1998 in reforming the banking and finance system. Um, it was less affected by the global financial crisis. So I think what the crisis will do, hopefully, is... Uh, allow for a convergence of minds on what are the models that we need in order to mobilize the capital that clearly does lie within Asia and it does lie um, within the constituency of Asian institutions together with multilaterals and other providers of private capital to come together but what we need is a is a framework that makes uh, social infrastructure and um, broader commercial infrastructure a feasible asset class to invest into. And that's the challenge that we have uh, lying ahead of us. Okay, and final question, Dr. Tu, to you, if you don't mind. You talked about ASEP, you talked about trade deals, and you talked about China accelerating its reform program. I want to ask you very specifically though, do you see China significantly cutting its negative list? And if so, when? And what sort of impact will that have uh, in terms of the, you know, the tensions between the US and China? Uh, yes, uh, in the in the recent uh, two sessions, uh, uh, Premier Li Keqiang uh, announced that China will significantly reduce uh, the uh, uh, items on the negative list for foreign investment. And also, uh, we are uh, trying to make a negative list on cross-border trading services. Uh, I think uh, these are very, very important for uh, uh, the development of uh, in international uh, trade and investment, uh, especially you know China is less open in uh, services sector. Uh, so uh, I think these actions uh, will uh, significantly promote uh, the uh, openness of uh, China's services industries. Uh, this then this will create more opportunities for I think more for uh, developed uh, countries companies. Uh, including the United, U.S. companies, so um, so I think, uh, as I said, uh, China is uh, trying to unilaterally uh, open up uh, its economy further. Uh, although we are not sure about the reactions of the United States, uh, but uh, we just uh, do our own job better uh, than wait for some uh, maybe some uh, good points. <laughs> Okay. Well, look, I'm afraid uh, we, we, we need to leave it there. In fact, we've run over time. Uh, I would like to thank all of my panellists, Dr. Kopo Kuhn, uh, Mukta Hussain, Cesar Harissima, and Dr. Tu Sing Jen. Thank you very much, all of you, for a really interesting, insightful, uh, and considered discussion. Thanks to all the audience for your participation in questions and for joining us today. My great thanks to, to the interpreters who translated this into Mandarin very valuable for all those listening uh, in Mandarin. And also thanks to Business China, a great partner to work with. And we do hope that we can do more with you. So with that, we need to sign off. Thank you all very much indeed. Very grateful to you for your contributions. Do stay safe, stay well, and hopefully talk to you very soon. Goodbye. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.